Part one of Two American Slavery Documents. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Two American Slavery Documents by Various. Part one life of james mars a slave born and sold in connecticut by james mars to whom it may concern these will certify that the bearer deacon james mars has been known to me and to the citizens of this town for a long period of years as an honest upright truthful man a good citizen an officer in his church and a man whose life and character have gained the approbation the esteem and the good wishes of all who know him born a slave the good providence of god has long since made him free and i trust also taught him that where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty jonathan todd pittsfield massachusetts june twenty three eighteen sixty eight introduction when i made up my mind to write this story it was not to publish it but it was at the request of my sister that lived in africa and has lived there more than thirty years she had heard our parents tell about our being slaves but she was not born until a number of years after they were free when the war in which we have been engaged began the thought came to her mind that her parents and brothers and sisters were once slaves and she wrote to me from africa for the story i came to norfolk on a visit at the time the war broke out and some in norfolk remember that i was once a slave they asked me about it i told them something about it they seemed to take an interest in it and as i was in norfolk now and having an opportunity to write it i thought i would write it all through in telling it to those there were a great many things that i did not mention that i have written after i had written it out i saw that my brother and my other sister would think that i might give them the same and my children had often asked me to write it when i had got it written as it made more writing than i was willing to undertake to give each of them one i thought i would have it printed and perhaps i might sell enough to pay the expenses as many of the people now on the stage of life do not know that slavery ever lived in connecticut end of letter and introduction a slave born and sold in connecticut the treatment of slaves was different at the north from the south at the north they were admitted to be a species of the human family i was told when a slave boy that some of the people said that slaves had no souls and that they would never go to heaven let them do ever so well my father was born in the state of new york i think in columbia county he had i think three different masters in that state one by the name of van epps and he was general van rensselaer's slave in the time of the revolution and was a soldier in that war he was then owned by a man whose name was rutzer and then was owned in connecticut and salisbury and then by the minister in north canaan my mother was born in old virginia in loudon county i do not remember the name of the town the minister of north canaan whose name was thompson went to virginia for a wife or she came to him in some way they got together so that they became man and wife he removed her to canaan and she brought her slaves with her and my mother was one of them i think there were two of my mother's brothers also the rev mr thompson as he was then called bought my father and he was married to my mother by him mr thompson ministered to the people of canaan in holy things his slaves worked his farm for a short time things went on very well but soon the north and the south as now fell out the south must rule and after a time the north would not be ruled the minister's wife told my father if she only had him south where she could have at her call a half dozen men she would have him stripped and flogged until he was cut in strings and see if he would do as she bid him she told him you mind boy i will have you there yet and you will get your pay for all that you've done my father was a man of considerable muscular strength and was not easily frightened into obedience 
i have heard my mother say she has often seen her mother tied up and whipped until the blood ran across the floor in the room where she was tied and whipped well as i said the south and the north could not agree the south seceded and left the north the minister's wife would not live north and she and her husband picked up and went south and left my father and mother in canaan to work the farm and they lived on the farm until i was eight years old my mother had one child when she came from the south i was the first she had after she was married they had five children born in canaan three died in infancy i was born march third seventeen ninety mr thompson used to come up from virginia and talk about our going south he would pat me on the head and tell me what a fine boy i was once when he was in canaan he asked me if i would not like to go with him and drive the carriage for my mistress he said if i would go he would give me twenty-five cents or as it was then called twenty-five coppers i told him i wanted the money first he gave me a quarter and then i would not agree to go and he put me in the oven that i did not like and when i got out i would not give him the money but his business i did not yet know he had come to sell his farm and to take us all south my father said he would not go alive the minister told him he must go my father said he never would well the man that had formerly ministered to the people in holy things sold the farm and stock and tools and effects with a few exceptions he kept a pair of horses and harness a wagon a bed and a few such articles the harness and wagon he kept to take us to the south with after he sold his place he took us all to a wealthy friend of his until he had settled up all his affairs so as to show to the world that he was an honest and upright man he would have them think that he feared god and let alone evil for he was born or raised in the state of new york and had taught the people of new canaan the way to do as you will see for in former days he spoke to the people from the pulpit morally and they thought much of the man he had taught them slavery was right and that the great almighty god had sanctioned the institution and he would practise it he now made his arrangements to set out on his journey the day was fixed to leave his much-loved people and home for his southern home where he had obtained a new home and friends and acquaintances my father although a slave without education was intensely watching the movements of the teacher of the people but kept all that he saw to himself yet he was steadily planning his escape the set day had now within about thirty-six hours come all went on well with the man from the south he had had no thought but all was well those fine chattels were his and would fetch him in a southern market at a moderate estimate two thousand dollars they would furnish him pocket change for some time and also his loving wife could have a chance to wreak her vengeance on my father for what she called disobedience it was a matter of doubt with my father what course to take how he could get away with his family the best and safest whether to go to massachusetts which joined canaan on the north or to norfolk which joined canaan on the east very fortunately for us there was at that time an unpleasant feeling existing between the two towns or the inhabitants of canaan and norfolk he said that the people of canaan would side with their former pastor and he found that the people of norfolk would take sides against canaan and their pastor then he thought the best that he could do would be to take his family to norfolk where they would be the safest he concluded to take them to norfolk but how was he to get them there with what he wanted to take with them he came to the conclusion that the horses he had for a long time driven might as well help him now in this hour of distress as not he got a colored man to help him that was stout and healthy they hitched up the parson's team put on board what few things he had and his family in the still of a dark night for it was very dark and started for norfolk and on the way we run afoul of a man's woodpile for it was so dark that he could not see the road 
but we got off from the woodpile without harm and arrived in norfolk about one o'clock i think we stopped at a tavern kept by mr g pettibone and in him we found a friend we unloaded what we had and father and the man that was with him took the team back to canaan so that the parson might set out on his journey and not have to wait for his team and father returned to where he had left his family he felt that he had done all for the parson that he well could for he had taken away his family off from his hands so that the parson would be relieved from the care that must necessarily occur in such a long journey with a family on his hands to see to and my father thought that the parson's old jewel would be relieved from some of her pardoned habits and from a promise she had so often made to him when she got him south well how the parson felt when he had got himself out of bed and found that he was left to pursue his journey alone the reader can tell as well as i for he was a big and bristle man but i will leave him for a while and see what is to be done with us it was soon known in the morning that we were in norfolk the first inquiry was where will they be safe the place was soon found there was a man by the name of phelps that had a house that was not occupied it was out of the way and out of sight after breakfast we went to the house it was well located it needed some cleaning and that my mother could do as well as the next woman we all went to work and got it cleaned and the next day went into it and stopped some time father did what work he could get out of the way where he would not be seen and it was necessary for him to keep out of sight for norfolk was the thoroughfare to hartford days and weeks passed on and we began to feel quite happy hoping that the parson had gone south as we heard nothing from him at length we heard that he said he would have the two boys at all hazards it was thought best that the boys should be away so one dark night we heard that the parson was coming out with his men to find the boys for have them he would a man that lived near to us said he would take the boys where they would be safe his name was katy it was agreed on and he went with us over a mountain over rocks and logs it was very rough and steep and the night was so dark that we could only see when it lightened at last we got through the woods on the top of what is called burr mountain we could look down on low grounds and see logs that were laid for the road across the meadow at every flash they could be seen but when it did not lighten we could not see anything we kept on our pilot knew the way at last we arrived at the place the name of the family was tibbles the family consisted of an old man a middle-aged man and his wife and four children and a very pleasant family it was we had not been there long before it was thought best that my brother should be still more out of the way as he was about six years older than i which made him an object of greater search and they were at a loss where to send him as he was then about fourteen years of age there was a young man by the name of butler from massachusetts he was in norfolk at the time setting law he said he would take him home with him and he did so as i supposed and i saw him no more for more than two years i stopped with the family a few days and then went home or what i called home it was where my parents and sister were i found them very lonely i had not been home many days before our quiet was disturbed for the parson had his hunters out to find our whereabouts he somehow found where we were my sister and myself were at play out at the door we saw two men in the woods a little from the house coming very fast and they came into the house my father was not far from the house mother was in the house the men were captain phelps the man who owned the house and mr butler the law student they told us that we must now say whether we would go with the parson or not and we must decide quick for the parson was coming and he would soon be on the spot and there was no time to lose mother had said she was not unwilling to go herself if it was not for father and the children and the parson had made her such promises that she was somewhat inclined to go 
the parson talked so fair to her he beguiled her i suppose somewhat as our first mother was beguiled in the garden the beguilers were both i do not say preachers but they were both deceivers and he talked so smooth to mother that he beguiled her he told her if she would go to canaan and see to his things and pack them up for him then if she did not want to go she need not mother talked with father he did not incline to go but finally he consented the parson ordered a wagon and it was soon on the spot but where was joseph he was not here i want him to go with us that we may be all together said the parson father saw what the parson's plan was he told him the boy was on the way he could get him when we got to canaan i should have said that those two men that came to tell us that the parson was coming hid in the barn before the parson arrived and were not seen by him they had a few words with my father while the parson went for his team we set off for canaan and in the land of canaan we arrived that day where is joseph father said he would go for him the next day in the morning or in the day father went as the parson supposed for joseph the parson was loading mother was packing all was now going on well night came and when all was still for father had told someone it would be late before he got back he came and took the parson's horses and took mother and the two children on horseback and instead of going south went to norfolk and got there about two o'clock in the morning we stopped at a tavern kept by captain lawrence the horses were sent back for the parson for he said he should start the next day but it seemed that he did not start for old virginia for we often heard of him after that day we stopped with captain lawrence a few days it was thought best by our friends that we should not all be together for it was found that the parson was still in the land and on the lookout for us i was sent to a woman in the neighborhood by the name of darby a poor woman i stopped with her a few days with instructions to keep still the old lady had but one room in her house you may wonder why i was sent to such a place most likely it was thought she had so little room that she would not be suspected of harboring a fugitive a man by the name of walter lived near by he was in the habit of coming in to see how his boy did as he called me he told me when any one came there i must get under the bed i used to sit in the corner of the room so that i should not be seen from the window i stayed there a number of days i do not now remember how many one day i ventured to take a peep through the keyhole the door was locked someone came to the door i made a bound and then a roll and i was out of sight the door was opened and it was my friend mr walter he was quite amused to hear the performance he said he would take me with him the next day he was going to work in a back lot where it would be out of sight so the next day i went with him it was quite a treat at noon we ate our dinner in the field that was new to me after dinner mr walter lay down on the ground he told me he should go to sleep and i must keep a lookout to see if any one came in sight if i saw any one i must wake him i kept watch but there was none came to disturb him in his repose the day passed away and we returned home at night all well as i supposed but it seemed that the parson had his pickets out and had got an idea that i was somewhere in the street that night i had to leave my place at mrs darby's and went about a mile to a man's house by the name of upson he lived on a back street i thought him to be a friend i do not know but he was but as i find that men now act in relation to slavery i am inclined to think otherwise the next morning the man went to his work he was painting for the minister in norfolk mrs upson sent me to the brook a little way from the house to fetch a pail of water i did not like going into the street very much but being taught by my parents to obey i went without any words as i got to the brook a man rode into the brook with a cocked hat on i did not much like his looks i did not know who he was said he my boy where is your father and mother 
I said, I don't know, sir. Where is your brother? I don't know, sir. Where do you live? I don't know, sir. Whom do you stay with? I don't know, sir. I did not then know the name of the man. He rode off, or rather I left him asking questions. He looked after me till I got to the house and rode up. I asked Mrs. Upson who it was that came to the brook when I was there. She said it was Mr. Robbins, the minister. I thought nothing of it, for I thought all the people in Norfolk were our friends. In a few hours the woman sent me to the neighbors to get some water from the well. It was a widow woman where I went to get the water, and there I found my father. He said that Captain Lawrence had been there and told him that Mr. Robbins had sent his son to Canaan to tell Parson Thompson that he had seen one of his boys and we must go in the woods, for he thought the parson would come out to look for me. Father took the water and went with it to the house that I brought the pail from. The family where I went for the water I shall always remember with the kindest feelings. We have ever from that day to the present been on the best terms, and I believe three of them are living now. Two of them live in that same house that they then lived in, and the transactions of this narrative took place sixty-five years ago their name is curtis end of part one part two of two american slavery documents by various this librivox recording is in the public domain part two life of james mars a slave born and sold in connecticut by james mars when father came back we set off for the woods pointed out by our friends we went across the lots and came to a road and crossed that into another open field the woods were in the back side of the field as we went on we ascended a ridge of land and we could see the road that led from canaan to norfolk the road then went past the burying ground and we could see it from where we were we saw fourteen men on horseback they were men we knew the parson was one of them we hid behind a log that was near us until they got out of sight we then went into the woods and there we found my mother and sister they had been sent there by the man that had told us of the parson's information of where i was we all remained there this i should think was about two or three o'clock in the afternoon very soon the thought of night came to mind how we were to spend the night and what we should do for something to eat but between sundown and dark a man passed along by the edge of the woods whistling as he went after he had passed on father went up where the man went along and came back with a pail or basket and in it was our supper we sat down and ate the man we saw no more that night but how were we to spend the night i could not tell it was starlight yet it was out in the woods but father and mother were there and that was a comfort to us children but we soon fell asleep and forgot all our troubles and in the morning we awoke and were still in the woods in due time the man that passed along the night before came again with more food for us and then went his way his name was walter we spent several days in the woods how many i do not remember i think it was the fore part of the week when we went into the woods we were there over the sabbath for i well remember a man by the name of bishop had a shop where he fulled and dressed cloth not very far from where we were and he came to the back door of his shop and stood and looked out a while and went in and shut the door i felt afraid he would see us we kept very still but i think he did not know that we were there if he did it did us no hurt we were fed by kind friends all the time we were in the woods one afternoon or towards night it was thought it would be safe to go to a barn and sleep after it was dark we went to a barn belonging to a mr munger and slept but left it while the stars were shining and so for a few nights and then it was thought we might sleep in the house the next night after dark we went in the house of mr munger for the night 
my sister and myself were put up in a back chamber behind barrels and boxes closely put together out of sight for safe keeping we had not been there long before mother came and told us we must get up for captain lawrence our friend had sent word that the parson said he would have the boys at any rate whether he got the parents or not his pickets were going to search every house within a mile of the meeting-house that night or search until he found them but we went into the woods again we were there a while again when it rained and we went sometimes into a barn when we dared after a time it was rather still and we were at one house and sometimes at another we had pickets out as well as the parson it was thought best that i should not be with the rest of the family for the hunt seemed to be for the boys my brother i have said was out of the state i was sent to one family and then to another not in one place long at a time the parson began to think the task harder than he had an idea it rather grew worse and more perplexing he did not know what to do he was outwitted in all his attempts every effort or trial he had made had failed he now thought of giving my father and mother and sister their freedom if they would let him have the boys to take with him this they would not do after some time was spent the parson or his pickets had an idea that we were all at captain lawrence's house shut up there how to find out if we were there or not was the puzzle they contrived various plans but did not succeed finally there was one thing yet they knew that mr lawrence loved money they thought they would tempt him with that so they came to his house and made trial they met together one day and wanted to search his house he would not consent for a time they urged and he refused he finally told them on certain conditions they might go into every room but one they went into all the rooms but one they then wanted to go into the room that they had not been into they offered him money to let them go into the room how much he did not tell as i know of he finally consented the much-desired room was a chamber over the kitchen. Mr. Lawrence opened the door at the foot of the stairs and called and said, "'Jupiter,' for that was my father's first name, "'you must look out for yourself now, for I cannot hide you any longer.' He then told the parson's pickets they must take care, for Jupiter says he will kill the first man that lays hands on him. They hesitated some. They then went upstairs still and stopped a short time, and then with a rush against the door it gave way and they all went in they found the landlady sitting there as composed as summer with her knitting work unconscious of an arrest to go south as a slave but they found us not although the room they last went into was the last one we had occupied all the time we were in that house sometimes one night sometimes a week and then in the woods or elsewhere as was thought best to keep out of the way the pickets returned to the land of canaan to see what was to be the next move the parson then proposed to give my father and mother and sister their freedom if they would let him have the boys that they would not do but the boys he said he must have as my brother was away it was thought best that i should be away i was sent to mr Pease, well nigh canaan and kept rather dark i was there for a time and i went to stay with a man by the name of camp and was with him a time and then i went to stay with a man by the name of akins and stayed with him a few days and went to a man by the name of foot and was with him a few days i went to another man by the name of akins and was there some time the parson was not gone south yet for he could not well give up his prey he then proposed to sell the boys until they were twenty-five to somebody here that my parents would select for that was as long as the law of connecticut could hold slaves and he would give the other members of the family their freedom it was finally thought best to do that if the purchasers that were acceptable could be found some friends were on the lookout finally a man by the name of bingham was found it was a man that my father was once a slave to he would take my brother 
then a man by the name of munger would buy me if they could agree mr bingham lived in salisbury mr munger lived in norfolk the two men lived about fifteen miles apart both in connecticut the trade was made and we two boys were sold for one hundred pounds a head lawful money yes sold by a man a minister of the gospel in connecticut the land of steady habits it would seem that the parson was a worshipper with the athenians as paul said unto them when he stood on mars hill he saw an inscription on one of their altars and it would seem that the parson forgot or passed over the instruction of the apostle that god made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth the parson was a tall man standing six feet in his boots and had no legitimate children to be heirs to his ill-gotten gains the bargain was made on the twelfth of september seventeen ninety eight then i was informed that i was sold to mr munger and must go and live with him the man i did not know but the thought of being sold not knowing whether i was ever to see my parents or brother or sister again was more than i could endure the thought that i was sold as i did not then know for how long it was hard to think of and where were my parents i knew not it was a sad thought but go i must the next morning i was to go the morning of the thirteenth was a sad morning to me the morning was clear without a cloud i was told where the man lived and i must go for he had bought me i thought of my parents should i oh should i never see them again as i was taught to obey my superiors i set out it was a little over a mile the way was long i went alone tears ran down my cheeks i then felt for the first time that i was alone in the world no home no friends and none to care for me tears ran but it did no good i must go and on i went and now sixty-five years have passed away since that time those feelings are fresh in my memory but on my way to my new home i saw my father i will not attempt to describe my feelings when he told me he had taken rooms in the same neighbourhood and should be near me that made the rough way smooth i went on then cheerful and happy i arrived at the place i found a man with a small family it consisted of himself and wife and three daughters the oldest was near my age the family appeared pleasant i ate a bowl of bread and milk and was told to mount a horse that was at the door with a bag of rye on his back and ride to the field that was about a mile off the man went with me and on the way we passed the house of mrs curtis where i mentioned in the former part of this narrative of going for well water for mrs upson we went to the field and worked that day went home at night the family appeared very pleasant and i felt pleased to think that the parson had gone for i was told that he went the same day that i went to my new home in a short time my father and mother and sister came into the neighbourhood to live i was allowed to go and see them one evening in two weeks they lived about sixty rods from where i lived things went on well i was very contented and felt glad that the fear of being carried south was at an end the parson was out of town and out of mind i soon became acquainted with mrs curtis's boys for i passed the house where they lived every day as mr munger's farm was beyond where they lived i soon was feeling contented and happy there was one thing that was unfortunate for me mr munger was not a stout strong man and not very healthy and had no other help but me and of course i had many things to do beyond my strength i do not complain of many things yet there are two things more i will mention one of them i feel to this day and that i feel the most is that i did not have an opportunity to go to school as much as i should for all the books i ever had in school were a spelling book a primer a testament a reading book called third part and after that a columbian orator 
my schooling was broken and unsteady after the first and second winters as mr munger had no help and had to go something like two miles for his wood he would take me with him to the woods and he would take a load and go home and leave me to chop while he was gone the wood was taken off from a fallow where he had sowed rye it was in piles some had to be cut once and some twice and some three times i went to school the most of the first winter after that my schooling was slim the other thing was he was fond of using the lash i thought so then and made up my mind if i ever was the strongest i would pay back some of it however things went on and i thought a good deal of mr munger yet i wonder sometimes why i was not more contented than i was and then i wonder why i was as contented as i was the summers that i was thirteen and fourteen i was sick they began to think i had the consumption they sometimes would say to me if you should die we should lose a hundred pounds i do not know as mr munger ever said that but it was said to me but i will pass on with my story i soon found out that i was to live or stay with the man until i was twenty-five i found that white boys who were bound out were bound until they were twenty-one i thought that rather strange for those boys told me they were to have one hundred dollars when their time was out they would say to me sometimes you have to work four years longer than we do and get nothing when you have done and we get one hundred dollars a bible and two suits of clothes this i thought of some of the family or friends of the family would tell me what a good boy i should be because mr munger saved me from slavery they said i must call him master but mr munger never told me so so i never did if he had told me to i should have done so for i stood greatly in fear of him and dreaded his displeasure for i did not like the lash i had made up my mind that i would not stay with him after i was twenty-one unless my brother did with the man he lived with my brother had been home to see us and we went once to see him i asked my brother how long he was going to stay with mr bingham he said mr bingham said he should have his time when he was twenty-one well then i should have my time i said to myself things went on and i found mr munger to be a very good sort of a man i had now got to be fifteen years of age i had got my health and had grown to be a big boy and was called pretty stout as the word is yet i was afraid of mr munger i actually stood in fear of him i had now got to be in my sixteenth year when a little affair happened which though trivial in itself yet was of consequence to me it was in the season of haying and we were going to the hayfield after a load of hay mr munger and i were in the cart he sitting on one side and i on the other he took the fork in both of his hands and said to me very pleasantly don't you wish you were stout enough to pull this away from me i looked at him and said i guess i can but i did not think so he held it toward me with both his hands hold of the stale i looked at him and then at the fork hardly daring to take hold of it and wondering what he meant for this was altogether new he said just now see if you can do it i took hold of it rather reluctantly but i shut my hand tight i did as samson did in the temple i bowed with all my might and he came to me very suddenly the first thought that was in my mind was my back is safe now all went on well for two months or more all was pleasant when one day he or mr munger i should have said was going from home and he told me as was usual what to do i went to my work and did it just as he told me at night when he came home he asked me what i had been doing i told him but he did not seem satisfied i told him i had done just what he told me he said i had not done what i ought to have done and i told him i had done what he told me that was more than i had ever said before he was angry and got his horsewhip and said he would learn me he raised his hand and stood ready to strike i said you had better not i then went out at the door 
i felt grieved to see him in such a rage when i had done just as he told me and i could not account for it if he had been a drinking man i should not have wondered but he was not he was a sober man i could not get over my feeling for some time but all was pleasant the next day i said to his daughters that i would not stay there a day after i was twenty-one for i did not know what their father meant i did just as he told me and thought i was doing what he would be satisfied with they told me not to mind it things went on from that time as well as i could wish from that time until i was twenty-one i do not remember that he ever gave me an unpleasant word or look while i lived with him after that time i felt that i had now got as good a place as any of the boys that were living out i often went with his team to hartford and to hudson which the other boys did not that lived in the neighbourhood i now felt that i could do anything for the family i was contented and happy the year that i was eighteen mr munger was concerned in an iron establishment manufacturing iron he had a sister living in oneida county and he learned that iron was high or brought a good price there he told me he thought he would send a load out there and get a load of wheat and asked me if i would go out with a load i told him i would if he wished me to he said he did he got everything ready and i set out the seventeenth day of october and thought it would take me about two weeks or thereabouts on i went and when i got there i could exchange my iron for wheat readily but none had their wheat out and their barn floors were so full that they could not thrash i had to wait a week as soon as i got my load i set out for home i was gone a day or two over three weeks after i got to norfolk i passed the house where my parents lived they told me that it was very current with the people that i had sold the horses and wagon and was seen by some one that knew me and was on my way to canada they said that mr munger said he did not believe it he said he should not trouble himself yet i went on home he was glad to see me asked if i had any bad luck i told him how it was and he was satisfied and said when he saw the team that they were in better condition than they were when i left home now they may talk as much as they please you and the team wagon and load are here and when i told him what i had done he said he was perfectly satisfied i had done well he had no fault to find everything went on first rate i did my best to please him and it seemed to me that the family did the same i now took the hardest end of the work i was willing to do what i could i was willing to work and thought much of the family and they thought something of me mr munger was receiving his share of offices of the town and was from home a portion of his time i felt ambitious to have our work even with others he said his work went on as well as if he was here End of part two. Part three of Two American Slavery Documents by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three Life of James Mars, a slave born and sold in Connecticut by James Mars. When I was in my twentieth year, a nephew of Mr. Munger came to board with him he was studying law mr munger and i were accustomed to talk about my term of service with him i told him i did not mean to stay with him until i was twenty-five he said he thought i would if i meant to do what was fair and just i told him that my brother had his time when he was twenty-one and i wanted my time he finally had some talk with his nephew who said that he could hold me but finally mr munger made me an offer of what he would give me if i would stay i thought the offer was tolerably fair i had now become attached to the family i told him that i would stay as he had often said he thought i ought to stay after i was twenty-one i thought i would divide the time with him in part as the offer he made would not cover the whole time all was fixed and i worked on nothing more was said for a long time about it 
then the thing was spoken about and the same mind was in us both and i felt satisfied the fall previous to my being twenty-one came all was right as i thought the winter came and nothing was said the last of february came i heard it hinted that mr munger had said that he should not make any bargain with me but if i left him he would follow me the thing was understood by us and i paid no attention to it march came and nothing was said the third of march was my birthday all was quiet and i kept on as before until the first of april it was told me that mr munger said that his nephew had examined the law and found that he could hold me and what he gave me would be his unless he was bound by a written agreement as there were no writings given i began to think it was time to know how it was there was another thing now came to mind when i was thirteen years old mr munger bought a calf of my father and gave it to me and said he would keep it until it was two years old and then i might sell it and have what it brought he kept it he had a mate for it and when the steers were two years old he sold them for twenty four dollars he then told me that he would give me a heifer of the age the steer was and when she had a calf he would take her to double in four years when i was seventeen he gave me a heifer and she had a calf that spring and the first of april he said he would take her and at the end of four years from that time he would give me two cows and two calves that was agreed on the next year in march or april one of his oxen hooked my cow it hurt her so that the cow died well now what was to be done he said at the time agreed on i should have my cows i was content with that and worked on feeling that all would be made right i thought i should have two cows with those calves when i was twenty-one and that would be a beginning afterward i agreed to stay with him until i was twenty-five i could let them until that time i will now go on with my story i asked him for my cows and calves he said he should not let me have any he said if i stayed and did well perhaps he would give me a cow i asked him if that was all that i was to have if i stayed until i was twenty-five he said he would see i asked when he would see he said when the time came i then told him i had been told that warren that was the name of his nephew had told him not to give me what he had agreed to and i wanted to know if he would do as he had agreed to or not he said i belonged to him and i could not help myself i told him i would stay with him as i had said if he would give me a writing obligating himself to give me the sum we had agreed upon after hesitating a short time he said he would not give a writing he would not be bound i told him i had got that impression and if you say you will not give me what you said you would i will not work another day he then said if i left him he would put me in jail and keep me there a year at any rate this was on saturday the next day i picked up what few duds i had and at evening as it was the sabbath i told him i had done all the work for him that i should do i then bade him good night and left his house and went to my father's the next day in the afternoon mr munger and nephew came to my father's with a sheriff i was not in the house he told my father that he would pay my board in jail for one year and i could not help myself they took what few clothes i had and went away before i got home it was well it was so i told my father that i would stay in jail as long as mr munger would find money i sent the word to mr munger he sent me word that i should have an opportunity to my people wanted to have me go away for a time i thought at first i would then i saw that i had nothing to go with and had no clothes for a change i would not leave i told them i would go to jail i thought perhaps i could get the liberty of the yard and then i could earn something to get some clothes and then i would leave for canada or some other parts a few days after i heard that mr munger said he would leave it to men how it should be settled and he sent me such word i sent word to him no i was going to jail if he would keep his word he finally said as i had always been faithful he would not or had rather not put me in jail 
my parents said so much they did not want to have me go to jail that i finally said i would leave it to three men if they were men that i liked if they were not i would not he said i might name the men their judgment was to be final the men were selected the time and place specified the day came the parties met and the men were on hand mr munger had his nephew for counsel i pled my case myself a number of the neighbors were present mr munger's counsel began by saying that his uncle had bought me and had paid for me until i was twenty-five and that he had a right to me i then told his nephew that i would have a right to him some day for he was the cause of all the difficulty he said no more the arbitrators asked mr munger if he had anything against me he said he had not they asked him in case they gave him anything if he wished me to work it out with him he said he did they went out in a few moments and returned and said that i must pay mr munger ninety dollars he then asked me to go home with him and he would hire me i told him i would go and get my clothes for that was in the decision he said i could have them his nephew did not want me to live with his uncle if he boarded with him i told mr munger that i would not work for him i hired to another man and went to work in the same neighborhood this nephew kept an eye on me for a long time and always gave me the road whenever he saw me coming mr munger and family always treated me with attention whenever i met them they made me welcome to their house and to their table if that nephew had not interfered there would have been no trouble things all went on pleasantly in about four years i went there again to work and in a short time mr munger and his two daughters joined the church of which his wife was a member i joined the same church and was often at his house mr munger was unfortunate and lost his property not as people lose their property now he was poor and not very healthy and his wife and daughter that was not married not being healthy and he being a man advanced in life it wore upon him and his family and his daughter went into a decline i went west and was gone about three months and on my return went to see the family and found the daughter very much out of health and wasting away i called again the next day but one as i had been accustomed to take care of the sick she asked me to stop with her that night i did so and went to my work in the morning the second day after i called again to see her and she made the same request i stayed and watched with her that night she asked what i thought of her i told her i feared she would never be any better she then asked me to stay with her if she did not get any better while she lived i told her i would a cousin of hers a young lady was there and we took the care of her for four weeks i mention this because it was a time to be remembered and cherished by me while i lived we were in the daily habit of speaking of her prospects and how she felt she would speak of death with as much apparent composure as of any other subject she said very little to her friends about her feelings the day that she died was the evening of the sabbath about six o'clock in the afternoon or rather all that day she did not appear to be as well but at the same time just mentioned she sunk away and seemed to be gone for a short time when she revived as one out of sleep suddenly and seemed surprised and said there is nothing that i want to stay here for let me go she then bade her friends farewell and told them not to weep for her for she was going her countenance seemed as if lit up with heavenly love and for a short time she seemed to be away from the world and then was still and said but little about eleven o'clock she wanted to be moved she was moved she then wanted to drink i gave her or put the glass to her lips she did not swallow any i saw there was a change and before her friends could get into the room her spirit had fled that was a scene that i love to think of it makes me almost forget that i ever was a slave to her father but so it was i stayed until she was buried and then i went west again her parents were broken-hearted indeed 
I returned from the West and spent a part of the summer with Mr. Munger. I afterwards worked where I chose for a few years. I was frequently at Mr. Munger's house. He seemed depressed, his health rather declined, and he finally sank down and was sick. He sent for me, I went to him, and he said he wished to have me stay with him. I told him I would, and I stayed with him until he died, and closed the eyes of his daughter when she died, and his also. And now to look back on the whole transaction, it all seems like a dream. It is all past, never to be reacted. That family have all gone, with one exception. Appendix this appendix is by request of those who have read what is before it after the death of mr munger i married a wife and lived in norfolk a few years we had two children we went to hartford after a while i worked for the then known firm of e and r terry there was a man came to hartford from savannah with his family he came to school his daughter he brought a slave girl with him to care for the smaller children my wife washed for the family. All went on well for about two years. The southern man's name was Bullock, and the slave's name was Nancy. One day, when I was at work at the store, a gentleman came where I was. He asked me if this was Deacon Mars. I said, yes, sir. He said Mr. Bullock was about to send Nancy to Savannah, and we want to make a strike for her liberty, and we want some man to sign a petition for a writ of habeas corpus to bring Mr. Bullock before Judge Williams. They tell me that you are the man to sign the petition. I asked him who was to draw the writ. He said Mr. William W. Ellsworth. I went to Mr. Ellsworth's office with the man. I signed the petition. I then went to my work. I told Mr. Ellsworth that it would cause an excitement. If he wanted me at any time, I would be on hand. The writ was served on Mr. Bullock, and he was brought before Judge Williams, but Nancy could not be found. The court adjourned till eight o'clock the next morning. At night, Nancy came to the house where they were boarding. She had been out as she was accustomed to go with the children. Mrs. Bullock told Nancy to go to bed. She somehow had an idea that all was not right. She opened the door and gave it a swing to shut, but it did not shut, as she said afterwards. She thought she would see what they were talking about. She said Mrs. B. told Mr. Bullock to start in the morning at four o'clock with Nancy for New York. Never mind the bond and send Nancy south. I omitted to mention that the court put Mr. Bullock under a bond of $400 to appear the next morning at 8 o'clock. The plan to send Nancy south was fixed on. Nancy said to herself, When you come where I be, I won't be there. She went out of the house and went to the house of a colored man and stopped for the night. The next morning the court sat. Master and slave were both there. The court said it was the first case of the kind ever tried in the state of Connecticut, and the Supreme Court of Errors was to meet in ten days, and was composed of five judges. He would adjourn the trial until the session of that court. During those ten days I had a fair opportunity to see how strong a hold slavery had on the feelings of the people in Hartford. I was frowned upon. I was blamed. I was told that I had done wrong. The house where I lived would be pulled down, I should be mobbed, and all kinds of scarecrows were talked about, and this by men of wealth and standing. I kept on about my work, not much alarmed. The ten days passed away, the Supreme Court of Errors sat, Judge Williams was chief judge. The case was argued on both sides. When the plea was ended, then came the decision. Two of the court would send Nancy back to slavery, two were for her release. We shall hear from Williams tomorrow at eight o'clock. At the time appointed, all were in attendance to hear from Judge Williams. The judge said that slavery was tolerated in some of the states, but it was not now in this state. We all like to be free. This girl would like to be free. He said she should be free. The law of the state made her free, when brought here by her master. This made a change in the feelings of the people. I could pass along the streets in quiet. Nancy said when she went into the courthouse on the last day she had two large pills of opium. 
had she been sentenced to go back she would have swallowed both of them before she left the courthouse now to my family i have said that i had two children born in norfolk and six in hartford one died in infancy i lived in hartford about sixteen years i took a very prominent part in the organization of the talcott street church i moved from hartford to pittsfield massachusetts when i had been there three years and a half my wife died in november the may following i lost a son sixteen years of age my oldest son enlisted in the u s navy when he was eighteen and has followed the sea ever since i had another that went to sea that i have not heard from for eight years my oldest daughter went to africa to cape palmas she went out a teacher and has been there five years i have one son who when the war broke out when the first gun was fired on sumter wanted to enlist and did enlist in the navy and went out in the brig bainbridge and served until she was stopped for repairs he then went on the newburn and served his time and was an honorable discharge another and the last one enlisted in the artillery and went to new orleans but never no never came back nor will he ever come again i have a daughter in massachusetts of a frail constitution she has a family to care for i have none to care for me that has anything to spare yet my children are willing to help as far as they are able as they are not able i feel willing to do all that i can to help to get my living the question is sometimes asked me if i have not any means of support the fact is i have nothing but what i have saved within the last three years i have spent a portion of that time with my book about the country i am now in my eightieth year of age i cannot labor but little and finding the public have a desire to know something of what slavery was in the state of connecticut in its time and how long since it was at an end in what year it was done away and believing that i have stated the facts many are willing to purchase the book to satisfy themselves as to slavery in connecticut some told me that they did not know that slavery was ever allowed in connecticut and some affirm that it never did exist in the state what i have written of my own history seems to satisfy the minds of those that read it that the so-called favored state the land of good morals and steady habits was ever a slave state and that slaves were driven through the streets tied or fastened together for market this seems to surprise some that i meet but it was true i have it from reliable authority yes this was done in connecticut august twenty second eighteen sixty six i had a fall and uncapped my knee that laid me by ten months so that i was unable to travel or do anything to help myself but by the help of him that does all things well i have got so as to be able to walk with a staff during the time that i was confined with my knee i met with kind treatment although i was away from home i was in the state of new york at the time of my misfortune away from any of my relations still i was under the watchful care of a friend that sticketh closer than a brother he has thus far provided for me and i feel assured that he will if i trust him with all my heart and soul and strength and serve him faithfully which is my duty the few years or days that are allotted to me and it is my prayer that i may have grace to keep me that i may not dishonor the cause of christ but that i may do that which will be acceptable in the sight of my heavenly father so that i may do good to my fellow men one thing in my history i have not mentioned which i think of importance although born and raised in connecticut yes and lived in connecticut more than three-fourths of my life it has been my privilege to vote at five presidential elections twice it was my privilege and pleasure to help elect the lamented and murdered lincoln i am often asked when slavery was abolished in connecticut my answer is the legislature in seventeen eighty eight passed an act that freed all that were born after seventeen ninety two those born before that time that were able to take care of themselves must serve until they were twenty-five 
my time of slavery expired in 1815. Connecticut, I love thy name, but not thy restrictions. I think the time is not far distant when the colored man will have his rights in Connecticut. End of Part 3 of Life of James Mars, A Slave Born and Sold in Connecticut by James Mars Part 4 of Two American Slavery Documents. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Facts for the People of the Free States by Anonymous. Chapter 1, Southern Scenes in 1846. Murder of Slaves. The Abbeville, South Carolina banner states that two of Governor McDuffie's slaves were killed on Friday, February 13th, by two other slaves acting in the capacity of drivers. They were killed by what the law terms moderate correction. A slave woman attempting suicide at Baltimore. In June 1846, the Baltimore Sun gave an account of a woman who jumped out of the window of the place in which her owner had confined her and immediately took the nearest route to throw herself into the water. She was rescued. But, says the son, upon being taken upon the deck of the vessel, she begged the bystanders to let her drown herself, stating that she would sooner be dead than go back again to be beaten as she had been. A slave suicide effected at Richmond, Virginia. A correspondent of the Philadelphia Inquirer, July 25, 1846, wrote from Richmond as follows. An unpleasant occurrence took place in this city yesterday. A man, who has a number of Negroes in his employment, was proceeding, for a slight offense, to punish one of them by whipping, when the poor wretch, knowing his master's unmerciful nature, implored that he might be hung at once instead of whipped. This, of course, would not answer, and on tying the Negro's hands behind him in the usual manner, the employer went into another room to procure a cowhide, when the Negro, taking advantage of his master's absence, rushed from the room, jumped into the river, and was drowned. Slave Suicide and Slave Hunting in Louisiana in june eighteen forty six the new orleans commercial times said we learned that a few days since a negro man belonging to captain newport of east baton rouge while closely pursued by the dogs of mr rourke of this parish ascended a tree and hung himself mr rourke with captain newport's son-in-law and overseer were in pursuit of a runaway slave they did not know that this negro was out and were surprised upon their arrival a few minutes in the rear of the dogs to find him suspended by his neck with his feet dangling only a foot or two from the earth every effort was made to restore animation but without success although on their coming up the body was still warm the act was one it would seem of resolute predetermination as the slave was well provided with cords which he made use of to perpetrate his suicidal purpose more murders of slaves the palmyra missouri courier in august eighteen forty six says we understand that a gentleman living in macon county while out hunting with his rifle last week came suddenly upon two fugitive slaves who gave him battle he shot one and split the other's skull with the barrel of his gun he then started for home, but before reaching it, he met a man in the road who inquired if he had seen or heard of two runaway Negroes, describing them. The gentleman replied that he had just killed two, and related the circumstance. On proceeding to the spot, the stranger identified them as his slaves. Chapter 2. The Fugitive Slave A Slave Hunter Killed the following is from the Washington, Pennsylvania Patriot of 1846. We learn that a few days ago, a fugitive slave from Maryland was pursued and overtaken in Somerset County in this state by a man named Holland, a wagoner from Ohio, who was tempted to the task by the reward offered, $150. When they reached McCarty's Tavern, the slave attempted to escape, but was caught by Holland while in the act of climbing a fence. 
the slave drew a long knife which he had concealed about his person and plunged it into holland's heart causing his death instantly he made good his escape immediately pursued by the people of the neighborhood who at nightfall had surrounded him but in the darkness of the night he eluded their vigilance and is now beyond their reach the rights of the fugitive the hon j r giddings in a speech in the house of representatives at washington february eighteen eighteen forty six said in regard to arresting slaves we of the free states owe no duties to the master on the contrary all our sympathies our feelings and our moral duties beyond what i have stated are with the slave we will neither arrest him for the master nor will we assist the master in making such arrest i am aware that the third clause of the second section of the first article of the constitution was once believed by some to impose upon the people of these free states the duty of arresting fugitive slaves but it is now judicially settled that no such obligation rests upon us indeed a proposition to impose upon us such a duty at the time of framing the constitution was rejected without a division by the convention we therefore leave the master to arrest the slave if he can and we leave the slave to defend himself against the master if he can we do not interfere between them the slave possesses as perfect a right to defend his person and his liberty against the master as any citizen of our state our laws protect him against every other person except the master or his agent but they leave him to protect himself against them if he while defending himself slays the master our laws do not interfere to punish him in any way further than they would any other person who should slay a man in actual self-defense the laws of the slave state cannot reach him nor is there any law of god or man that condemns him on the contrary our reason our judgment our humanity approves the act and we admire the courage and firmness with which he defends the inalienable rights with which the god of nature has endowed him we regard him as a hero worthy of imitation and we place his name in the same category with that of madison washington who on board the creole boldly maintained his god-given rights against those inhuman pirates who were carrying him and his fellow-servants to a worse than savage slave market another slave suicide the slave of a farmer in an adjoining county jefferson having been jumped upon and stamped by his master with spurs on so as to cruelly lacerate his face as well as his body he was found next morning in an adjacent pond or stream of water having tied a stone to his own neck as it is said and plunged in for the successful purpose of drowning himself under the feelings of desperation caused by the fiendish treatment of his master baltimore saturday visitor august eighteen forty six presidential testimonies george washington i never mean unless some particular circumstance should compel me to it to possess another slave by purchase it being among my first wishes to see some plan adopted by which slavery in this country may be abolished by law letter to john f mercer there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than i do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of it slavery but there is only one proper and effectual mode by which it can be accomplished and that is by the legislative authority and this as far as my suffrage will go will not be wanting letter to robert morris john adams great is truth great is liberty great is humanity and they must and will prevail thomas jefferson the rightful power of all legislation is to declare and enforce only our natural rights and duties and take none of them from us no man has a natural right to commit aggressions on the equal rights of another and this is all from which the law ought to restrain him every man is under a natural duty of contributing to the necessities of society 
and this is all the law should enforce upon him when the laws have declared and enforced all this they have fulfilled their functions the idea is quite unfounded that on entering into society we give up any natural right the whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submissions on the other and with what execration should the statesman be loaded who permitting one half the citizens thus to trample on the rights of the others transforms those into despots and these into enemies destroys the morals of the one part and the love of country of the other for if a slave can have a country in this world it must be any other in preference to that in which he is born to live and labour for another and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis a conviction on the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of god that they are not to be violated but with his wrath indeed i tremble for my country when i reflect that god is just and that his justice cannot sleep for ever when the measure of the slave's tears shall be full when their tears shall have involved heaven itself in darkness doubtless a god of justice will awaken to their distress and by diffusing light and liberality among their oppressors or at length by his exterminating thunder manifest his attention to things of the world and that they are not left to the guidance of blind fatality notes on virginia james madison it seemed now to be pretty well understood that the real difference of interest lay not between the large and small but between the northern and southern states the institution of slavery and its consequences formed the line of discrimination speech in the convention for the formation of the federal constitution james monroe we have found that this evil slavery has preyed upon the very vitals of the union and has been prejudicial to all the states in which it has existed speech in the virginia convention john q adams nay i may go further and insist that that the slave representation has ever been in fact the ruling power of this government the history of the union has afforded a continual proof that this representation of property which they enjoy has secured to the slaveholding states the control of the national policy and almost without exception the possession of the highest executive office of the union speech in congress february fourth eighteen thirty three fellow citizens the numbers of free men constituting your nation are much greater than those of the slaveholding states bond and free you have at least three-fifths of the whole population of the union your influence on the legislation and the administration of the government ought to be in proportion of three to two but how stands the fact by means of the double representation the minority command the whole and a knot of slaveholders give the law and prescribe the policy of the country speech at north bridgewater november sixth eighteen forty four james k polk on the twelfth of may eighteen forty one a resolution was introduced in congress to the effect that the president of the united states be requested to renew and to prosecute from time to time such negotiations with the several maritime powers of europe and america as he may deem expedient for the effectual abolition of the african slave trade and its ultimate denunciation as piracy under the law of nations by the consent of the civilized world the vote on this resolution was a hundred and eighteen ayes and thirty-two nays james k polk voting in the negative congressional debates volume seven page eight fifty mr polk since occupying the presidency has pardoned two individuals convicted in the courts of having been engaged in this trade chapter three burdens of slavery on the free the presidency 
of the fourteen presidential terms now expired since the formation of the government eleven have been filled by slaveholders one by a northern man with southern principles and only two by northern men the present incumbent is a slaveholder sworn fully to do his utmost to uphold and even extend the abomination and most terribly he is fulfilling his vow in the surrender of free territory in oregon and in a war of conquest for slavery in mexico at a cost of millions of dollars and thousands of lives by holding the presidency slavery controls the cabinet the diplomacy the army and the navy of the country the power that controls the presidency controls the nation no northern president has been allowed to serve more than one term the vice presidency the president exercises much of his power by and with the senate the vice president is ex officio president of the senate as such he has the casting vote in all questions before that body for the last twenty years with one exception he has been a slaveholder from the adoption of the constitution up to june eighteen forty two there were seventy six elections in the senate of president pro tem of these the slave states had sixty and the free states sixteen most of the sixteen were in the earlier periods of the government mr southard was elected in eighteen forty two previous to that no northern man had received the appointment for thirty years so careful were the slaveholders to watch their interest by securing the casting vote senate for a long series of years the senate has been equally divided between the free and the slave states in this condition of it it was a great point with the slaveholders to secure the casting vote of the vice presidency and right carefully have they done it this vote is of less importance now since by the admission of texas the balance of power is broken up and the valley of rascals on any tie vote now rules the senate and the nation department of state the office of secretary of state is the most important of any perhaps in the cabinet of the president as it is the duty of this officer to direct the correspondence with foreign courts instruct our foreign ministers negotiate treaties and so forth his station is second only in importance to that of the presidency itself of the fifteen who had filled this office up to eighteen forty five the slave states have had ten the free states five the whole number of officers in this department at washington in eighteen forty six is eighty six of these virginia has six and the district of columbia forty five the war department in eighteen forty six there are at washington ninety eight officers in this department of these the district of columbia has forty nine exactly one half and virginia and maryland have the balance the free states generally have furnished the seamen and the soldiers the men to do the fighting and endure the hard knocks but slavery has taken care to furnish southern men for officers thus of one thousand fifty four naval officers new england has only a hundred and seventy two of the sixty eight commanders new england has only eleven of the three hundred and twenty eight lieutenants new england has only fifty nine of the five hundred and sixty two midshipmen new england has only eighty two and new england owns nearly half the tonnage of the country of all the officers in the navy in eighteen forty four whether in service or waiting orders pennsylvania with a free population more than double that of virginia had but a hundred and seventy seven while virginia had two hundred and twenty four in eighteen forty two under mr upshore of a hundred and ninety one naval appointments the slave states had a hundred and seventeen the free states only seventy three post office the greatest opposition to cheap postage is from the south the reason is obvious as multitudes of their post routes do not pay for themselves they must be paid for through a system of high postage by the north or be given up thus in eighteen forty two the deficit in the post office department from the slave states was five hundred and seventy one thousand dollars while the excess over the expenditure in the free states 
was six hundred thousand dollars this went of course to make up the deficiency of the south so that in eighteen forty two alone the north paid all its own postage and five hundred and seventy one thousand dollars of postage for the south nor was this all the whole number of miles of mail transportation for eighteen forty two was thirty four million eight hundred and thirty five thousand nine hundred and ninety one at an expense of three million eighty seven thousand seven hundred and ninety six dollars of these miles the mail was carried twenty million three hundred and thirty one thousand four hundred and sixty one at the cost of one million five hundred and eight thousand four hundred and thirteen dollars in the free states and fourteen million five hundred and four five hundred and thirty miles at a cost of one million five hundred and seventy nine thousand three hundred and eighty three in the slave states that is it cost seventy thousand nine hundred and seventy dollars more to carry the mail in the slave states than in the free while it ran five million eight hundred and twenty six thousand nine hundred and thirty one miles less under the new system from official returns presenting a comparative view of the postage received at forty two offices north and south during the third quarter of eighteen forty four and eighteen forty five it appears that while the falling off at the offices in the free states has not been one-third that at the offices in the slave states has been more than one-half civil diplomatic and consular agencies that most of the spoils of office in these departments go to the slaveholders is well known the following is the diplomatic agency of eighteen forty six full ministers to great britain louis mclean france william r king spain romulus m saunders turkey dabney s carr mexico john slidell brazil henry a wise all from slave states and russia r i ingersoll from connecticut charges austria william a stiles holland august devizek belgium thomas a glenson the two sicilies william h polk sardinia robert wycliffe portugal abraham wrencher venezuela benjamin shields buenos aires george harris chile william crump all from the slave states and from the free states only denmark william w irwin sweden by h w ellsworth central american b w bidlack and peru a g jewett thus of the seven full ministers six are from the slave states and of the thirteen charges nine are from the same and the four given to northern men are among the most insignificant governments in the world and this favoritism of the south has been the policy for years the civil and consular agencies are dispensed with a like injustice to the free states the following prepared by professor cleveland gives the number of persons employed in eighteen forty five in these several agencies from a few states with their salaries and the number of free white inhabitants in the same presidential electors during the twenty years ending in eighteen thirty two there were six presidential elections of these the south cast six hundred and eight electoral votes but only forty one of them for northern candidates during the twenty years ending in eighteen thirty five there were five presidential elections in which the south cast five hundred and fifteen electoral votes only eleven of which were for northern candidates in the presidential election of eighteen forty four thirteen free states had a hundred and sixty one electors and gave one million eight hundred and ninety thousand eight hundred and eighty four votes one elector to eleven thousand seven hundred and thirty nine votes while twelve slave states had a hundred and five electors and gave seven hundred and ninety eight thousand eight hundred and forty eight votes one elector to six thousand six hundred and eight votes in other terms six slave state votes counted as much in choice of president and vice president as eleven free state votes in the same election michigan had five electors and gave fifty six thousand two hundred and twenty two votes or one elector to eleven thousand two hundred and forty four votes while louisiana had six electors and gave twenty six thousand eight hundred and sixty five votes 
for one elector to four thousand four hundred and forty seven votes that is four slaveholding louisiana votes were equal to eleven free michigan votes federal representation the present number of the house of representatives including texas is two hundred and twenty eight of these twenty one represent slave property in fixing the ratio of representation after the last census the house adopted that of fifty thousand one hundred and seventy nine this would have given a house of three hundred and six members and the free states a majority of sixty eight but a small majority is more easily managed than a large the senate rejected that ratio and sent back the bill with the ratio of seventy thousand six hundred and eighty this reduced the house to two hundred and twenty three and brought down the majority of the free states to the more manageable number of forty seven the effect of the odd number six hundred and eighty was to deprive the four great states of the north massachusetts new york pennsylvania and ohio of one member each with no corresponding disadvantage to any slave state of this proceeding even the correspondent of the new york herald said the senate apportionment has robbed the north of at least one quarter of its practical influence in the union when regarded in its full extent and the members of the free states who voted for it have thus surrendered the rights of their constituents and violated their trusts the house of representatives the speaker of the house has the appointment of all committees and of course exerts an immense influence in this as well as other ways in the legislation of the country during thirty-one of the thirty-four years from eighteen eleven to eighteen forty five the speakers were all slaveholders judiciary the supreme court of the united states is the court of highest appeal in the nation its decision on all questions coming before it is final of the thirty judges of this court the slave states have had seventeen the free states thirteen the circuits and salaries are still more unequal and unjust vermont connecticut and new york with forty-two representatives in congress and a free population of over three millions constitute but one circuit while alabama and louisiana with but eleven representatives and a free population of but half a million constitute another so of other circuits louisiana with a free population of a hundred and eighty three thousand nine hundred and fifty nine has one judge at a salary of three thousand dollars ohio with a population of one million five hundred and nineteen thousand four hundred and sixty one more than eight times as great as that of louisiana has only one judge at a salary of one thousand dollars that is with eight times as many people to do business for he receives one-third as much pay arkansas with a free population of seventy seven thousand six hundred and thirty nine has one judge at a salary of two thousand dollars new hampshire with a population of two hundred and eighty four thousand five hundred and seventy three has but one judge at a salary of a thousand dollars mississippi with a free population of a hundred and eighty thousand four hundred and forty has one judge at a salary of two thousand five hundred indiana with a population of six hundred and eighty five thousand eight hundred and sixty three has but one judge at a salary of a thousand dollars that is two-fifths as much pay for doing more than three times the work surplus revenue the surplus revenue distributed by the act of eighteen thirty six amounted to thirty seven million four hundred and sixty eight thousand eight hundred and fifty nine dollars the slaveholders managed to have it distributed not as it should have been on the basis of free population but that of federal representation thereby the south with a free population of three million eight hundred and twenty three thousand two hundred and eighty nine received sixteen million fifty eight thousand eighty two dollars and eighty five cents while the north with a free population of seven million eight thousand four hundred and fifty one received but twenty one million four hundred and ten thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars and twelve cents so that for each inhabitant of the free north there was received but three dollars and six cents while for each free person in the south there was received four dollars and twenty cents 
or one dollar and fourteen cents more for each free person in the south than for each free person in the north the south by this operation alone received for her slave representation in congress four million three hundred and fifty eight thousand five hundred and forty nine dollars revolutionary war in this war new hampshire massachusetts rhode island connecticut new york new jersey and pennsylvania seven states furnished one hundred and seventy two thousand four hundred and thirty six troops and were paid for services sixty one million nine hundred and seventy one thousand hundred and sixty seven dollars delaware maryland virginia north carolina south carolina and georgia six states furnished fifty nine thousand three hundred and thirty five troops and received fifty two million four hundred and thirty eight thousand a hundred and thirty dollars in other terms the northern states furnished about three times the number of troops and received less than one-fifth more pay in particular states the inequality was far greater the war of eighteen twelve the slaveholders envied the commercial prosperity of the north and to crush it decreed the war of eighteen twelve under the pretense of defending free trade and sailors rights and one hundred and thirty seven millions of dollars were wasted in its prosecution and two hundred million more were lost on sea and land by northern merchants and farmers and then leaving free trade and sailors rights where they were before they made peace and demanded a national bank and protective tariff and in the prosecution of the war says alvin stewart esq addressed to abolitionists august eighteen forty six the south placed major general smith at buffalo a slaveholding lawyer of virginia major general winder a slaveholding lawyer of maryland at forty mile creek on the side of lake ontario major general wilkinson a louisiana slaveholder at the cedars and rapids of the st lawrence and major general wade hampton the great sugar boiler of louisiana and the largest slaveholder in the united states having over five thousand crushed human beings bowing to this monster and tyrant was located at burlington vermont four slaveholding generals with their four armies were stretched out on our northern frontier not to take canada but to prevent its being taken by the men of new england and new york in eighteen twelve thirteen and fourteen lest we should make some six or eight free states from canada if conquered this was treason against northern interests blood and honor this horrid revelation could have been proved by general john armstrong then secretary of war after he and mr madison quarrelled florida florida war removal of the indians while florida was in possession of spain it furnished an asylum for slaves escaping from the contiguous states it was therefore bought at the dictation of the slaveholders at an expense of five million dollars for the same purpose and at the same dictation the late florida war was waged and the native indian exiled of this the hon j r giddings eighteen forty five said they at the army captured four hundred and sixty negroes who were adjudged slaves by staff officers of the army to whom the duty was assigned and who delivered them over to interminable bondage see house doc fifty two third session twenty seventh congress we have no means by which we can determine the number of lives sacrificed in that war but it may be safely asserted that the capture of each slave cost the lives of two white men and at least eighty thousand dollars in cash the most of which was drawn from the pockets of the people of the free states the whole expense of the war is estimated at forty million dollars the moral guilt incurred and the sacrifice of national character cannot be estimated perhaps i ought to add on the authority of general jessup that bloodhounds were also purchased to act as auxiliaries to our army and that bloodhounds and soldiers and officers marched together under the star-spangled banner in pursuit of the panting fugitives who had fled from southern oppression house stock one twenty five third session twenty fifth congress and bloodhounds and soldiers and officers were paid for from the avails of northern industry while our people were not permitted to petition their servants to be relieved from such degradation 
one r fitzpatrick was employed to get the bloodhounds he obtained thirty-three and the cost including expenses of bringing to florida was five thousand dollars the removal of the indians from the several slave states was merely to make room for slavery and it has cost at least fifty million dollars and of all these millions the north has had to pay the largest share texas and the mexican war everybody knows that texas was annexed and that the war is waged to extend and strengthen slavery the cost of these measures is yet to be ascertained there is little doubt that it will exceed rather than fall short of one hundred millions bank tariff southern bankruptcy etc the south originated the bank and the tariff when they ceased to work for its interests the south abolished both the sums filched from the north by these changes of national polity and by southern bankrupts seem almost incredible twenty seven million dollars of the capital of the united states bank was sunk at the south five hundred million dollars it is estimated would not more than meet the losses of the north in sixty years from southern bankruptcy in fine there is no end to these burdens this sidewise plunder of the free by those whose entire life is a wholesale plunder of the slave how long will freemen bear it we have a weapon firmer set and better than the bayonet a weapon that comes down as still as snowflakes fall upon the sod but executes a free man's will as lightning does the will of god and from its force nor doors nor locks can shield you tis the ballot box chapter four slaveholding religion maintaining theological seminaries the following is the conclusion of an advertisement in the savannah republican of march twenty three eighteen forty five also at the same time and place the following negro slaves to wit charles peggy antoinette davy september maria jenny and isaac levied as the property of henry t hall to satisfy a mortgage five fee issued out of the supreme court in favor of the board of directors of the theological seminary of the synod of south carolina and georgia versus said henry t hall conditions cash c o'neill sheriff m c buying church furniture a runaway slave in eighteen forty one assigned the following as his reason for not communing with the church to which he belonged at the south the church said he had silver furniture for the administration of the lord's supper to procure which they sold my brother and i could not bear the feelings it produced to go forward and receive the sacrament from the vessels which were the purchase of my brother's blood supporting churches by slave jobbing the rev j cable of indiana may twenty eighteen forty six in a letter to the mercer luminary says i have lived eight years in a slave state virginia received my theological education at the union theological seminary near hampton sydney college those who know anything about slavery know the worst kind is jobbing slavery that is the hiring out of slaves from year to year while the master is not present to protect them it is the interest of the one who hires them to get the worth of his money of them and the loss is the master's if they die what shocked me more than anything else was the church engaged in this jobbing of slaves the college church which i attended and which was attended by all the students of hampton sydney college and union theological seminary held slaves enough to pay their pastor mr stanton one thousand dollars a year of which the church members did not pay a cent so i understand it the slaves who had been left to the church by some pious mother in israel had increased so as to be a large and still increasing fund those who hired out on christmas day of each year the day in which they celebrate the birth of our blessed saviour to the highest bidder these worked hard the whole year to pay the pastor his one thousand dollars a year and it was left to the caprice of their employers whether they ever heard one sermon for which they toiled hard the whole year to procure 
this was the church in which the professors of the seminary and the college often officiated since the abolitionists have made so much noise about the connection of the church with slavery the rev elisha ballanter informed me the church had sold this property and put the money in other stock there were four churches near the college church that were in the same situation with this and when i was in that country that supported the pastor a whole or in part in the same way viz a cumberland church john kirkpatrick pastor briny church william plummer pastor since dr p of richmond buffalo church mr cochran pastor pisgah church near the peaks of otter j mitchell pastor selling ministers as slaves at the great convention at cincinnati in june eighteen forty five mr needham of louisville kentucky said sir in eighteen forty four a methodist preacher with regular license and certificate was placed in the louisville jail as a slave on sale he preached in the jail sermons which would have done credit to any white preacher of the town he kept a little memorandum in his pocket in which he marked the number of persons hopefully converted under his preaching i represented his case to leading methodists in louisville and showed them a copy of his papers which i had taken not one of them visited him in his prison he said he forgave those who had imprisoned him and were about to sell him he was sold down the river which was the last time i saw him a slaveholding d d a whipping his bich on sabbath morning preparatory to preaching march twenty eighth eighteen forty three in a public address at cincinnati the rev edward smith true wesleyan of pittsburgh stated that he had lived in slave states thirty-two years and speaking of a certain d d of his acquaintance he adds he was a slaveholder and a severe one too and often with his own hands he applied the cowhide to the naked backs of his slaves on one occasion a woman that served in the house committed on sabbath morning an offence of too great magnitude to go unpunished until monday morning the doctor took his woman into the cellar and as is usual in such cases stripped her from her waist up and then applied the lash the woman writhed and winced under each stroke and cried o oh lord o oh lord o oh lord the doctor stopped and his hands fell to his side as though struck with palsy gazed on the woman with astonishment and thus addressed her the congregation must pardon me for repeating his words hush you b will you take the name of the lord in vain on the sabbath day when he had stopped the woman from the gross profanity of crying to god on the sabbath day he finished whipping her and then went and essayed to preach that gospel to his congregation which proclaims liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison doors to them who are bound the greatest impediment we are about to make an announcement says the true american which must sound very strange to those whose field of observation is unlike our own the greatest impediment to the success of the anti-slavery movement in the slave states is the opposition to it of those men who profess to have been commissioned by high heaven to go abroad and use their efforts for the mitigation of human misery and the extirpation of human wrong this assertion which appears so monstrous will not surprise any one who lives among slaveholders our conviction of its truth has been confirmed by extensive observation religious testimonies archbishop potter some of our wise ones will have it that doulos means slave archbishop potter than whom no man was more learned in grecian antiquities in his work on them published years ago says chapter ten slaves as long as they were under the government of a master were called oketi but after their freedom was granted them they were douloi not being like the former a part of their master's estate but only obliged to some grateful acknowledgment and small services such as were required of the metokoi to whom they were in some things inferior the younger edwards a pastor of a church in new haven and afterwards 
president of Union College, every man who cannot show that his negro hath by his voluntary conduct forfeited his liberty is obligated immediately to manumit him and to hold such as one in a state of slavery is to be every day guilty of robbing him of his liberty or of man-stealing and fifty years from this time seventeen ninety one it will be as shameful for a man to hold a negro slave as to be guilty of common robbery or theft dr adam clark among christians slavery is an enormity and a crime for which perdition has scarcely an adequate state of punishment rev albert barnes from the whole train of reasoning which i have pursued i trust it will not be considered as improper to regard it as a position clearly demonstrated that the fair influence of the christian religion would everywhere abolish slavery let its principles be acted out let its maxims prevail and rule in the hearts of all men and the system in the language of the princeton repertory would speedily come to an end in what way this is to be brought about and in what manner the influence of the church may be made to bear upon it are points on which there may be differences of opinion but there is one method which is obvious and which if everywhere practised would certainly lead to this result it is for the christian church to cease all connection with slavery rev s h cox d d the cause of human rights is only the converse of the cause of human duties and how pious or how orthodox or how heroic i should like to know is he for whose higher evangelical refinement of sensibility this subject of righteousness is too delicate to be theologized into our ethics our creed or our prayers away with such nauseating and hypocritical affectation in high places and low ones too letter to s j may auburn may fifth eighteen thirty five end of part four end of facts for the people of the free states by anonymous end of two american slavery documents by various